Yes, Mrs. Worthington, I understand. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Of course, Mrs. Worthington, I will definitely do it. Will that old chatterbox with blue hair ever shut up? Susan Morgan asked herself in despair, listening to the chatter of the wife of the chairman, of the board of the Birchgrove Mansion and Museum. But as Birchgrove's director of development, Susan knew she had no choice but to listen and agree with the older woman's ranting. The young woman was not one to suffer fools gladly, and was especially outraged when someone assumed that they were smarter than her simply because of their family's wealth. I'm sick and tired of rich bitches who think their money makes them authorities on other people's affairs, Susan growled to herself. A glance at her watch only added to her disappointment. She was late for an important meeting, but just as Susan was about to interrupt her, the elderly woman abruptly interrupted her monologue. My God, look at the time. If I don't hang up now, I'll be late for my hairdresser appointment. I understand, Mrs. Worthington. Sorry for keeping you so long, Susan replied without a hint of sarcasm. After the caller finally hung up, Susan quickly sent her husband an email. Dinner with a potential client. Do not wait. When the letter was sent, she hurriedly tidied up her desk, checked her makeup in her hand mirror, and then walked out the door of her small office. This room was originally the butler's pantry at the Birch Grove Mansion, but at least my name is on the door, she thought. As she walked down the corridor, Evita, her Latina secretary, called after her. Are you leaving, Senora Morgan? Without slowing her pace, Susan looked over her shoulder in irritation. I'm leaving to visit a potential donor. I won't be back today. Watching what was happening, Evita saw the rhythmic swing of the skirt from her boss's expensive suit and heard the click of her high heels on the marble floors of the mansion. As soon as the woman disappeared through the door, Evita rushed down the corridor to the executive director's office, stopping at his secretary's desk. He left? She asked Christina. Yes, Christina answered. He left about ten minutes ago. He said that he had to attend an important meeting. Evita grinned. Everything is like clockwork. This week, last week, the week before. Do they both need to go to meetings at the same time? Do they think we don't know what's really going on? She looked towards the exit and spat out. Confused! The two young women giggled and went back to their work. Professor Daniel Morgan looked around at the many faces in his introductory economics class. Although he knew that few would show any sustained interest in economics, he hoped that he could at least generate some intellectual curiosity about the subject. To spark this interest, it will take an unconventional approach. He clicked an icon on his tablet computer, and a projected image of a graph filled the wall behind him. Today, he intoned, we'll talk about the concepts of supply, demand, and price. Some comedian in the lecture hall let out a low groan, causing everyone to laugh. Daniel was unfazed. I know, I know, it's boring. But these abstract concepts have an impact in the real world. Let me give you an example. He bent down and picked up the work of art, holding it where everyone could see. Will anyone recognize this? He asked. Marilyn Monroe by Andy Warhol, said a female voice. Sorry, miss, I'm afraid you're in the wrong class. The art school is in another building, Daniel said sarcastically. When the laughter died down, Daniel smiled. Seriously, our art lover is absolutely right. So why am I showing you Andy Warhol in economics class? The answer is that this particular work, or at least one that looks almost exactly like it, sold in 2022 for just over 195 million. This makes her the current record holder for the best-selling American artist. The students whistled a couple of times. I believe, Daniel continued, that no one in this class was a buyer. This caused a few chuckles. Are there any billionaires here? Well, I hoped. In any case, the fact is that at that price there was only one buyer for Andy's Marilyn. However, any of us could go to the college bookstore right now and buy a print of Marilyn for about $20. And why are there so many buyers at the bookstore and so few at the auction? It's all about the price. At $195 million, there was only one buyer, but at $20, demand skyrockets. Before you object, 
I know that there are many factors that influence the market demand for any product, product, or service. We will look at them in future lessons. But the fact remains that price is one of, if not the most important, factor determining demand. When the lecture ended, Daniel was glad that several students came up to ask questions or argue another point of view. At least I made them think about the subject, he thought with satisfaction. Returning to his office, he hid Monroe's photograph behind a filing cabinet and then pulled his cell phone out of his pocket. He felt it vibrate during the lecture, but he made it a point to never stop class to check. Now he saw that Susan would not be home again this evening. It bothered him that it seemed to happen so often, but at least it gave him the opportunity to stop by and check on his father. When Ezra was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease several years ago, the older man insisted he was doing just fine in his own home. But Daniel saw his father's symptoms worsening, and his concern prompted him to visit him more often. When he reached his father on the phone, the older man began to ramble about real and imagined symptoms, doctors who don't know what they're doing, and the problems of the world in general. When Daniel finally managed to ask if it would be convenient for him to come over, his father insisted that he come and stay for dinner. Daniel tried to protest, but his father cut him off. Here, he said, talk to Paloma, and handed over the phone. Paloma was Ezra Morgan's nurse and guardian. When his father's condition deteriorated markedly, Daniel insisted that he be cared for full-time if he wanted to remain at home. The old man agreed sullenly and immediately began to reprimand every guardian the agency sent with his complaints, insults, and hostile behavior. Just when Daniel thought he would have no choice but to place his father in a nursing home, Paloma arrived. The young woman had two significant advantages over her predecessors. First of all, she was unexpectedly pretty, which Ezra definitely appreciated. Secondly, Paloma was not at all embarrassed by Ezra's boasting. When he snapped at her, she snapped back. When he refused to follow the doctor's orders, she pestered him until he gave in and complied. And when he was grumpy and harsh, she ignored him until he stopped trying to piss her off. One day, when Daniel stopped by to see how things were going with the new nurse, his father surprised him by declaring that he approved of Paloma. She won't take shit from me, he said, and Daniel dared to hope that they had finally found a solution. Those hopes were dealt a serious blow about ten months later, when Paloma called Daniel to tell him she was going to quit. This is my son Marco, she told him. My mother took care of him, but now my grandmother is sick and my mother has to live with her. Plus, Marco is ready to go to school, and there's just no way I can take care of him and Senor Morgan at the same time. If Daniel was upset by the news, Ezra simply refused to accept it. To Daniel's amazement, the old man came up with a solution. Come and live here in my house, he told her. This place is quite big. Plus, you'll save on rent and commuting costs. I'll even buy groceries. What about Marco? You don't want a six-year-old running around your house. You know, I used to have a six-year-old boy here. Be sadies. Marco will let me talk to him when I get tired of your whining. She went to Daniel's office to talk to him about the proposal. Once he recovered from the surprise, he began to see the benefits. In addition to receiving ongoing care from someone his father liked, Daniel thought that living in a family environment might benefit his father. It's up to you, Paloma, Daniel told her. I think it could be a good decision for Dad, and I know I would feel better if he had someone he liked taking care of him. But you have to decide if this is good for you and Marco. I believe it could work, Senor Daniel, but it would be better if you tried to come more often, you know, for your father's sake. And Marco would have liked it too. Then, to his surprise, she blushed deeply before turning and running out the door. Her reaction confused him, but he was delighted when he heard that she had accepted his father's proposal. Now, 18 months into the new arrangement, Daniel was not at all surprised to hear that his father was listening to Paloma's wishes, nor was he unhappy when she persuaded him to stay for dinner too. Considering the alternative was eating takeout alone at home on campus, Daniel didn't put up much resistance. In addition to her skills as a nurse, Paloma proved to be an excellent cook. It would be nice to eat home-cooked food for a change, he thought. 
and his mood improved. Susan hated the long drive through the countryside, but she knew it was necessary. Neither she nor Grant could afford to be recognized while they were developing prospects together. She was worried not only about the length of the road, but also about the fact that along the way she passed all the small, run-down houses. I used to live in a landfill just like this one, she thought, and the memories returned to her again. Her father abandoned the family when she and her sister were in elementary school. Her mother and two daughters were forced to move into a rented shack that her mother could barely afford on her maid's salary. The girls' classmates at school fared little better, but that didn't stop them from mercilessly harassing the two sisters. But Susan was smart. In high school, she had good grades, high enough to receive a full scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania. Education, she was taught, was the path out of poverty, the way to achieve the same lifestyle that all the other students seemed to enjoy. And while these girls were not unkind, socioeconomic differences could not be ignored. While her classmates danced at fraternity and sorority parties on the weekends, Susan was in her dorm studying for tests on Monday. While they spent the summer in Europe, she worked part-time on campus. However, during her senior year, Susan took a break when she caught the attention of a handsome economics teaching assistant. Daniel Morgan was on his way to a PhD, but he was no botanist. He had a good sense of humor and loved communication. When he met her, he found Susan's combination of intelligence and beauty irresistible. There were rules against relationships between teachers and undergrads, but since he was an economics major and she was a fine arts major, the rules were easy to ignore. Susan had already dated men a little and tried a few sexual encounters, but she was determined to become a better person and knew that a reputation as a slutty college girl was not the path to success. Now faced with the prospect of a relationship with a man with a future, she did everything she could to grab it. He never had a chance. A man with a future? Ha! She thought angrily. She expected Daniel to join one of the large investment banks or management consulting firms that regularly recruited on campus. When he told her that he dreamed of an academic career, she was quietly disappointed. But maybe in the end, he will head a large educational institution, she consoled herself. A little research on the internet convinced her that several university presidents had an economics background. But now, seven years after they got married, she found herself living on a university town and her husband happily teaching at the university. This is not the future I wanted, she cursed. In this spoiled environment, she took a job raising funds for a local museum in a converted mansion that had previously belonged to one of the oil barons of Pennsylvania. Once again, she found herself in debt to a bunch of rich matrons and their cutesy offspring, listening to their gossip, submitting to their imperious demands. But it won't be like this for long, she swore to herself, driving the car behind the small rural motel where she and Grant met. I found a new path to climb. Before Daniel could get out of the car at his father's house, the front door swung open and a small ball of boyish energy flew towards him. Senor Daniel, Senor Daniel, will you play football with me? Marco shouted. Marco! Paloma shouted, going out onto the porch. Leave Senor Daniel alone! He had been teaching all day and was tired. Before the little boy's face could fall, Daniel waved his mother away. It's okay, Paloma. Come on, Marco. Show me your skills. With these words, the two of them began to play, dribbling, passing, and hitting a soccer ball stained with grass. As they raced around the yard, Daniel noticed that Paloma had gone inside and brought his father out to look at them. The old man was delighted with what was happening, excitedly cheering them on, although he had never been to a football match in his life. They finally stopped when Paloma called them over for dinner. Marco protested, but Daniel was just as happy to leave. I'm not in shape to keep up with this boy, especially when playing football. Expecting traditional Latin American cuisine, Daniel was pleasantly surprised when Paloma served a Mediterranean-style dish. Chicken kebab with basmati rice, Greek salad, and pita bread on the side. Ezra grumbled that he wanted a hamburger, but Daniel noticed that he had eaten his entire plate. They ate dinner as a family, discussing their day, their plans for the week, 
and other little things that lifted Daniel's mood even more. He realized that he had not thought about Susan since he arrived. As they cleared away the plates, Paloma leaned over and whispered, In case you were wondering, I try to stick to the Mediterranean diet with Senor Morgan when he lets me. I want to protect his heart as much as possible. Thank you, Paloma. Whatever you're doing seems to be working. I haven't seen Dad this energetic in a long time. After the dishes were in the dishwasher, they all moved into the living room. After talking a little more, Daniel noticed that Marco had become quiet. I think even seven-year-old children can get tired after such an intense game, he thought with surprise. Paloma also noticed this and took Marco to his room. By the time she oversaw her son's bedtime preparations, he was already half asleep. But as soon as he lay down, his eyes opened again. Mom, can Senor Daniel come in and say goodnight to me? We don't want to impose ourselves on him, she said sternly, before softening. But I'll ask. Daniel liked the boy's request and readily followed Paloma back to Marco's bed. To his surprise, the boy reached out and hugged him, then lay down again, rolled over and closed his eyes. Good night, Marco, Daniel said gently, tucking the blanket over the boy's shoulder. Good night. When they returned to the office, Daniel saw that his father had also dozed off. He helped Paloma carry him back to the bedroom and put him to bed. Daniel was surprised to realize how little his father weighed. After the two of them returned to the office, Daniel thanked Paloma for dinner and told her he would be heading home. Aren't you going to stay a little longer? She asked, reaching for his hand before stopping herself. I... Could you tell me a little about the painting in the living room? Of course, he said, and followed her into the other room. There on the wall, in a special frame, hung a painting by Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe in blue. Unbreakable glass protected the frame, which was firmly screwed to the wall. At the four corners of the frame, there were special pads that were sensitive to any change in pressure between the wall and the work of art. On the opposite wall, two small devices emitted infrared beams, searching for anything that came too close to the work. I'm sure my dad warned you about all the safety precautions, Daniel said, and Paloma nodded. That's why I don't let Marco in here, she explained. One day he hit a soccer ball against the wall, and in the blink of an eye, security arrived to investigate. She shook her head. We will not repeat this mistake again. But what I don't know is how your father ended up with such a special painting. This is a good story. My grandfather was a printer in Germany before World War II. He escaped just before things got bad and came to America, leaving only his name. In fact, he lost part of it too. Some immigration officer at Ellis Island replaced Morgan Stern with Morgan. Anyway, my grandfather found a job as a printer in New York and brought his son, my father, into the business to learn the trade. My father became interested in silkscreen printing, which was just beginning to gain popularity for fine artwork in the early 1960s. Long story short, he ended up working as an apprentice at the company that printed many of Andy Warhol's silk screens. Apparently, Warhol once noticed that my father was working late and took a liking to him. Obeying an impulse, he gave him this picture on the wall and even signed the dedication on the back. This is a real gift to someone Warhol barely knew. I agree, but you have to remember that, at that time, Warhol sold his silk screens for only a few hundred dollars. He probably felt that the artist's evidence was simply not that valuable. In any case, it was only later that the value of Warhol's work began to skyrocket. But isn't it dangerous to keep it here? Not many people know that my father has a Warhol painting and it has never been appraised. But when this auction recently received so much publicity, we couldn't ignore the risk. It was then that my father took all safety measures. I won't say they're reliable, but as you and Marco learned, even touching the wall will trigger a quick response from security. She looked at the painting again. I can understand why your father wants to keep her here. He must be very proud of this. It is, Daniel nodded, and I'm very proud of him. Paloma smiled and nodded.
A little later, Daniel got into his car to drive back to the old Victorian house the university provided on campus. As he drove away, he looked back at the light coming through the windows of his father's house. I wish my house was as bright as this, he sighed. Susan was away a lot these days, and even when she was at home the atmosphere seemed cool. He shook his head and drove away. When Susan left the motel, she still felt the delicious sensations of post-coital bliss between her thighs. Nothing helps a girl relax like good sex, she thought with satisfaction. And Grant Nicholson was a good partner, in no small part because he was truly in love with her. His fervor practically oozed from his pores, and when they were in bed, he was desperate to give her pleasure after pleasure. But as she left their miserable love nest, her thoughts turned to her husband. It's not that Daniel is a bad husband, and he's certainly not a bad lover, but he simply doesn't have the drive and ambition that she needs. Grant loves talking to all these millionaires on the board of directors, and he's good at it. Daniel enjoys going to university parties and socializing with other professors. Every time she has to attend one of these events, she just wants to scream. She gripped the steering wheel tighter. But as soon as his old man dies and Daniel gets his inheritance, I will divorce him in a heartbeat. And once I get my half of the income from Warhol and the house, I'll have as much money as those rich bitches, not to mention a husband with a high reputation. As she drove up to their house, her face twisted into a grin. Housing at the university. Well, I can stand this dump a little longer, and so can my husband. The next time Daniel saw Paloma, she was not smiling. He had just finished taking an exam when he heard a knock on his office door. Looking up, he was startled to see a young woman standing there, and the look on her face filled him with worry. What happened, Paloma? Did something happen to my dad? Is Marco okay? She hurried in, closing the door behind her, and sat down on one of his side chairs. Your dad is fine, Daniel. My mother will live with him and Marco while I'm here, but... He shook his head impatiently. So what happened? What's happening? You know I have a big family in this area, right? I didn't know, but continue. One of my sisters, Christina, works at Birch Grove. She is the secretary of Senor Nicholson, the executive director. Fine. Anyway, Christina sees Mrs. Morgan at the mansion every day. Yes, but... Daniel... I'm very sorry, but your wife and Sayor Nicholson are having an affair. Her words hurt him greatly. His first instinct was to deny the possibility because he didn't want to believe it. But given the current state of his relationship with his wife, he immediately understood how the novel could explain what was happening. Pulling himself together, he leaned forward in his chair. How does your sister know this? He asked tensely. Paloma looked unhappy. We have a cousin who works as a maid at the Pocono View Motel. It's north of here, about 30 kilometers along the highway. He waved his hand impatiently and she hurried on. Your wife and Senor Nicholson meet there almost every week. The last time was two days ago, the evening you had dinner with Senor Morgan, Marco, and me. He gritted his teeth, remembering that night and how late Susan had gone to bed. But he spoke quietly and reservedly. Paloma... This is very serious. I can't just take the word of a person I've never met, even if she's your cousin. I know, I know, but you don't have to take her word for it. Is it possible? Could you go there with me right now? Half an hour later at the motel, Paloma introduced Daniel to her cousin Lourdes, whose command of English was rudimentary. But since Paloma was helping with the translation, the maid took the couple to a utility room in the motel's main hallway. She opened the grill into the ventilation system and pulled out the recording device that was hidden there. Daniel looked at Lords, then at Paloma. How did it get here? He growled. Our family was together, and Christina shared with us her suspicions about Senor Nicholson and his frequent meetings with Senora Morgan. When she showed us the photo, Lords recognized them as a couple who regularly visited the motel. She looked pleadingly at Daniel. Sorry, Daniel but I knew I had to find out the truth. I gave Lords the recorder. I hope you don't hate me for this. Daniel ignored her implied question. Instead, he pointed to the device. Did you listen to this? He demanded an answer. 
She lowered her head. Yes, partially. Lords played it for me when she called. That's when I realized that I had to tell you. Okay, Daniel said gloomily. Tell her to play the recording. When Lords pressed the arrow button, all three of them jumped at the volume. My God, Grant, there, 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 yes, yes, don't stop, don't stop, ah, ah, burst out from the small speaker. Lordies quickly stopped the playback and then turned to Paloma. Do you want her to go back to the beginning? Paloma asked Daniel. The Pele Daniel shook his head. I don't, no, I recognized Susan's voice. He rubbed his temples. I really don't want to hear the whole damn story. Let's just move on from here. The cousin fiddled with the volume control and then pressed play. At first they only heard the rustling of sheets and the groan of bed springs. A moment later the lover's conversation resumed. God, Susan, you are amazing. I just can't get enough of you, said Grant Nicholson's admiring voice. Then his tone became almost urgent. Honestly, baby, I don't want to wait anymore. Just tell me, and I will... Divorce my wife tomorrow. All I want is to be with you. No. Susan's voice sounded sharply. Don't you understand, Grant? We can't do anything until Daniel's old man dies. Once he dies and Daniel inherits Warhol, I can divorce him. He'll have to auction it off as part of the agreement, and I'll get my half of the proceeds. After this, you can say goodbye to Greta, and we will finally be together. Are you sure you can get half of Warhol? I thought the inheritance was protected. The smirk on her face was obvious from the sound of Susan's voice. Do not worry about it. I have a lawyer who knows how to get around this. And since he is paid based on compensation, I can guarantee you that he is highly motivated. Yes, but how much longer do we have to wait? Nicholson whined. Be patient, baby, Susan reassured him. The old man is quickly going downhill. We'll get what we want soon enough. Daniel reached out and angrily jabbed his finger at the off button. What an insidious bitch. She had it all figured out. He slammed his fist on the counter, startling the two women. He then turned and left the motel. Paloma gave Lords a quick hug, then grabbed the recorder and hurried to the parking lot. She found Daniel standing outside his car, staring into space. He turned to her as she approached, his eyes reflecting the anger and despair of a man who had been betrayed. I tried so hard, Paloma. I knew she was unhappy with our marriage, but I kept trying to make things right. His expression darkened. Now I know why nothing helped. Now his voice was full of determination. Get in the car. We need to go back to the city. She sat in the passenger seat and, as soon as they pulled out onto the road, timidly said, I hope you're not angry with me, Daniel. I felt that you wanted to know what she was doing. He shook his head from side to side. I'm not angry with you, Paloma, but I'm very angry with Susan. What are you going to do? You're not going to hurt her, are you? He glanced at her. Yes, I'm going to hurt her. And Nicholson, too. Seeing the expression on her face, he added, But not in the way you imagine. I'm not a cruel person, but I guarantee you they won't like what happens. She reached out to take his hand. I don't want you to get in trouble, Daniel. I just couldn't. He smiled slightly at her. Don't worry, Paloma. Everything will be fine. Then his smile disappeared. While you deal with your mother and Marco, I need to talk to my father. He shook his head sadly. He was so excited when I married Susan. She made a great impression on him. He couldn't wait for us to have children. When he hears what I found out, he'll be just as upset as I am. He looked at Paloma with an ironic expression on his face. It's ironic, you know. I got so upset every time Susan said she wasn't ready to start a family. But now, I'm really glad we didn't. They drove the rest of the way in silence, each immersed in their own thoughts. The conversation with the father was long and painful, but in the end, the two men came up with a plan of action. Daniel's first move was to file for divorce to thwart Susan's plan. His father promised to ask his own lawyer to recommend a divorce lawyer. He also warned his son not to say or do anything that might tip Susan off to what he had learned. 
I can do it, Dad, Daniel agreed. I'll just avoid her as much as possible until I'm ready to serve her. Considering how little time we already spend with each other, this shouldn't be too difficult. To hide his feelings, Daniel spent most of the weekend on campus, grading tests, updating lesson plans, and generally trying to ensure that his academic life wouldn't be too disrupted by his impending divorce. When his father called him with a recommendation on Monday, Daniel immediately contacted the lawyer's office to set up a meeting, but he was disappointed to learn he wouldn't be able to meet the woman until Thursday. He thought about looking for another lawyer online, but then changed his mind. If Susan is going to try to pull off some legal shenanigans, I need someone really good on my side. I can take this a little longer. When Thursday finally arrived, Daniel was glad he had been patient. His new lawyer seemed competent and confident. I think I know what your wife is planning, but I really don't think you need to worry about your father's painting, the woman assured him. Until we file an application promptly, Warhol will in no way become part of any property settlement. She promised that she would prepare his claim for filing next week and could prepare a writ of certiorari for service later that day. Almost ready, Daniel thought, as he headed back to his office on campus. And with any luck, we'll take care of Mr. Grant Nicholson, too. For the first time since he learned of Susan's betrayal, he felt himself relax a little. The call he received on Sunday shattered his complacency. When he answered, at first he heard nothing except the woman's sobs. I'm so sorry, Daniel. I tried so hard to help him. I really tried. Icy horror gripped his heart. Who can I help, Paloma? What's happened? This is Senor Morgan, she shouted then fell silent. I need to go. The ambulance doctors have arrived. The connection was interrupted. Jumping to his feet, Daniel ran to his car and raced to his father's house. He found the street blocked by a car, an ambulance, and another truck. Parking down the street, he ran to the house, arriving just in time to see the EMTs wheel a gurney onto the porch. He is okay? He asked in despair. The doctor looked at him. Are you the son? Yes, yes, it's me. Is he alive? The man slowly shook his head. Sorry, we couldn't do anything. When we arrived here, he was no longer there. His heart stopped beating. It appears he had a massive stroke or aneurysm. But what about defibrillation? Could that help? The man looked at him sympathetically. Sorry, sir, but even if we could restart his heart, nothing else would work, you understand? You wouldn't want that. And neither would he. As the gurney was loaded into the ambulance and slowly driven away, Daniel could only stand there in shock. Finally, he forced himself to trudge into the house. When Paloma saw him, she ran up to him and, sobbing, threw herself into his arms. I'm sorry, Daniel. I tried so hard to get him back. I did chest compressions until the paramedics arrived, but it wasn't enough. I am so sorry. Through his own tears... He pulled her away from him to look at her face. It's not your fault, Paloma. You did everything you could. I spoke to the ER doctor outside. He told me that Dad must have had a stroke or a brain aneurysm. He probably died before you got to him. She laid her head on Daniel's chest and continued to sob. He sat at the table and chatted with me. Suddenly he grabbed his head and told me that he was in pain. Then he simply rolled over and fell to the floor. Oh, Daniel, that was terrible. He carefully led the distraught woman to a chair to sit, then went to get water for both of them. When he returned, he asked, Where is Marco? Marco? Madre de Dios, I almost forgot he is at school. I have to go and get him. She cried again. Marco will be so upset. He really loved your father. She hurried away, leaving Daniel alone in the suddenly empty house. He sat there for a long time, Grief clouded his attempts to understand how his life had suddenly changed. He knew his father was dying, but he wasn't ready to lose him so soon. His own tears flowed freely again, and there was no one to console him. Finally, he pulled himself together enough to make a list of people he needed to notify and tasks he needed to complete. Once he had written down everything that came to his mind, he began the sad task of making phone calls. After calling or leaving messages for the most urgent group, Daniel locked up his father's house and drove to Birch Grove to complete the task he had saved for last. As much as he hated the thought, 
he decided to tell Susan the news in person. I want to see how she reacts, he thought bitterly. She was startled to see him enter her small office and, upon hearing the news, said all the right things and showed appropriate grief. But as he watched her, he had to bite his tongue to keep from venting his anger. These are crocodile tears, he raged to himself. She must be absolutely delighted, because now she can begin to implement her plan. But he managed to control himself until he left. As soon as he left, Susan ran out of her office, almost skipping down the corridor to tell Grant Nicholson the news. Grant was startled by Susan's sudden appearance and caught off guard by the news she blurted out. Automatically, he began to express condolences, but she interrupted him. Don't you see? This is good news. This is what we have been waiting for. Now that the old man is gone, his property goes to Daniel. I can file for divorce, settle property issues, and once it's final, you and I can be together. Grant felt his own excitement match hers. I can't believe the wait is over. So, when do you plan to file for divorce? She thought for a moment. I don't want to seem heartless. I will wait until his father is buried and the memorial service is over before I apply. That makes sense, Grant admitted, but don't wait too long. Remember, it will probably take me some time to work things out with Greta. The next few days for Daniel were filled with all the sorrowful duties that death entails. His first and most pressing duty was his father's funeral. Although his father was not observant, he left instructions that he wanted to be buried according to Jewish tradition. This meant arranging the burial for the next day. Once arrangements were made for his father's burial, Daniel began organizing a memorial service for friends and neighbors who were unable to attend the funeral. He had no other living relatives, but Ezra had made many friends during his career, and now they came to pay their last respects. Likewise, Daniel's friends and colleagues came to express their condolences and support. The fact that so many people were present gave him some comfort. Both the burial and memorial service were difficult for Daniel, not only because of the grief he felt, but also because he was forced to attend both with Susan. As before, she played the grieving wife perfectly. But Daniel knew what her true thoughts were, and his anger turned to burning hatred. During all of this, Daniel's new lawyer called for instructions on how to finalize Daniel's divorce. Given the many responsibilities he faced, Daniel asked her to put off his divorce. I'll have to call you back, he told her. My life is pretty crazy right now. After the memorial service concluded, a new and unexpected complication arose. Back at his father's house, Paloma asked him when he wanted Marco and her to move out. Daniel was stunned. You can't leave, Paloma. First of all, you have nowhere to go, and I'm not going to throw you out onto the street. For that matter, if a house is empty, it will become a target for thieves or vandals. Besides, if you go anywhere else, it will most likely mean transferring Marco to a new school. He's doing well where he is. I don't want to risk ruining everything. You should stay at least for a while, she gratefully agreed, fully aware that Daniel's kindness and concern were a more important factor than the reasons he gave. With his father buried and all services completed, Daniel then contacted his father's attorney to see what needed to be done regarding the administration of his father's estate. The list of steps he had to take in connection with the probate process was long. When he and Daniel finished looking through them, the lawyer added an unexpected duty. Ezra, the lawyer told Daniel, demanded that his will be read as soon as possible, before it was submitted for approval. Moreover, his father left a list of people who need to be invited. After hearing the list, Daniel understood everything. I have one request, he told the family lawyer. To make the reading of the will as formal as possible, can we hold it in your law office? If it's there and your office sends out invitations, I think it's more likely that everyone who's supposed to be there will show up. The old man readily agreed. On the appointed day of the probate reading, Daniel and Susan arrived separately at the lawyer's office. Taking their places at the small conference table in the law library, they greeted each other with strained cordiality. Other than services for his father, the two of them spent very little time together. Now, despite her outward calm, Daniel could tell that his wife was almost seething with excitement. He, on the other hand, was calm and collected. A few minutes later, Paloma came in and introduced herself to the lawyer. 
Susan stared at her, then leaned towards Daniel and asked angrily, What is she doing here? He stared at her without emotion. She was invited. Before Susan could respond, she was startled to see Grant Nicholson enter. Were you invited too? She asked. He nodded. I'm not sure why, but the invitation was absolutely clear. Just at that moment, the lawyer stood up and cleared his throat demonstratively. May I have your attention, please? It looks like everyone who was invited is present. It was the express wish of the late Mr. Morgan that each of you be present here at the reading of his last will and testament, he said in a sonorous voice. I will not test your patience by going over all the legal details of his will. Instead, Mr. Morgan wanted me to, as he put it, get to the point. He cleared his throat. First, the late Mr. Morgan named Daniel Morgan, his only child, as executor of his will. Daniel's responsibility will be to ensure that any taxes due are paid and any outstanding debts or other obligations are settled. Once these matters were properly resolved, he would see to it that the estate's assets were administered in accordance with his father's terms and wishes. Daniel has agreed to act in this capacity and, I am informed, has already begun the process of settling the estate's debts, taxes, and other obligations. Susan glanced quickly at Grant, giving him a fleeting smile of anticipation. This brings us to the distribution of assets, the lawyer continued. The first will concerns the house of Mr. Morgan, in which he lived for the last 27 years of his life, and the lot on which it stands. His will states, I hereby leave my house and lands to Paloma Contreras in gratitude for the long service she has given me during my illness and need. I also leave any funds remaining in my checking account to help her pay her bills. What? Susan screamed in surprise. How can he give his house to this, this maid? It should go to Daniel. Yes, you're right, Paloma intervened, recovering from her surprise. This should go to Daniel, not me. She looked at Daniel for support, but he did not return her gaze. Be that as it may, the lawyer continued, the late Mr. Morgan made his wishes very clear. Now may I move on to the second clause of the will? When the group calmed down, the lawyer continued, the second item in the will concerns an Andy Warhol painting that hangs in my living room. I hereby bequeath the Warhol painting to the Birch Grove Mansion and Museum to become part of its permanent collection. Oh my God, Nicholson gasped. No, this is all wrong, Susan screamed. He can't do that. He should have left Warhol to Daniel. Sorry, Mrs. Morgan, but Mr. Morgan explicitly bequeathed the Warhol painting to Birch Grove, the lawyer intoned. He wants it hung in a prominent place in the museum. But that means Daniel won't get anything, Susan squealed. Did his father cut him out of his will? How could he do this? It is not right. Ladies and gentlemen, the lawyer said loudly, if I may draw your attention, I have not finished reading the terms of the will. Please be aware that the second clause of the will made by Mr. Morgan is conditional. The will goes on to say, my gift to Birch Grove is subject to the fulfillment of two requirements. First, that Birch Grove must immediately and permanently sever any professional relationship with Mrs. Susan Morgan. Second, Mr. Grant Nicholson, CEO of Birch Grove, shall immediately and permanently cease the relationship he has maintained with Mrs. Susan Morgan. In the event that either of these two demands is not fully complied with, ownership of Warhol will pass to the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. He pointed to Grant Nicholson. In case you were wondering, sir, I sent notice of this condition of the will to Pittsburgh just before this meeting. It is my understanding that the Warhol Museum will monitor your compliance with these requirements very carefully. That's funny, Susan squealed. This annoying old man has no right to interfere in our personal lives. She turned to Daniel. This is all you're doing, isn't it? You are trying to deceive me from what is legally mine. I would never do that, Susan. In fact, what I have here is what legally belongs to you. With these words, he handed her the envelope that he had brought with him to the meeting. She tore it open and stared at the contents as if they were written in Greek. What is this? she asked. This is your official notice that I have filed for divorce, he said. Then, take out your iPhone 
and take a photo to document your actions. He said grimly, Susan Morgan, you have now been charged. You bastard, you can't divorce me, I'm divorcing you, she screamed. Daniel just smiled. While she was screaming, Susan didn't notice that Grant had quietly slipped out of the room. When she finally realized that he was gone, she hurried after him. Meanwhile, Paloma tried to argue with Daniel. This is wrong, Daniel. Senor Morgan should have left his house to you, not to me. You are his son. It is wrong that you have nothing. Now Daniel smiled. Paloma, it's okay. Dad and I discussed this. He loved you and Marco and wanted to make sure you were taken care of when he was gone. He knew that I understood everything and that I wanted it too. He took her by the shoulders and looked at her carefully. Do not... You see? He was a gruff, old-fashioned man who had difficulty expressing his feelings. He didn't know how to say how much he appreciated the care you showed, the companionship you provided, and the fact that you didn't take any crap on him. It was his way of expressing his love. She wiped away more tears. Marco and I, we loved him too, Daniel. Susan literally ran down the hallway at Birch Grove toward Grant's office. Ignoring his secretary, she stormed into her boss's office. Grant, Grant, she said breathlessly. This is wonderful news. With the addition of Warhol's paintings to the collection, Birch Grove will attract many new visitors. You will become the head of the most prestigious art museum in the area. Thank you, Susan, he answered carefully. I think you're right. And after everything settles down, she continued, our relationship will no longer have to remain a secret as you always wanted. His face narrowed. Didn't you hear the clause that the old man added to his will? He asked sharply. It can't possibly be legally binding, she retorted. This will cause some gossip at the country club, but it will pass quickly. With the exception of the Warhol Museum, he objected. They would be delighted to add such an important item to their collection, so they will be watching us very closely. The trembling in her voice betrayed her fear. But as I said, this cannot be legal. No court will comply with such a requirement. Now Grant was angry. Do you really expect Birch Grove to sue the Warhol Museum? Do you know what resources they have? They have money from the Carnegie Foundation behind them. If they sue, the legal fees could bankrupt us. He stood up and handed his former lover a stack of papers. I'm sorry, Susan, but I've already talked to Mr. Worthington about this. As of today, you are no longer an employee of Birch Grove. Grant, you can't do this. Not after everything we meant to each other. Then her tone became shriller. Besides, you don't want me to tell your wife about us. I've already confessed to her, he told Susan coldly. And as soon as I'm done here, I'll go home to continue groveling. I hope the prestige of the wife of the executive director of Birch Grove will soothe her offended feelings. Now it's time for you to leave the mansion. We will arrange for the severance package to be sent to you by mail. She stood and glared at him, her fists pressed to her sides. Instinctively, he took half a step back, fearing that she might attack him. Instead, she turned on her heel and walked away, heading down the corridor to her former office. She quickly grabbed a few personal items and left. Walking past her secretary's desk, Evita asked, Are you leaving, Mrs. Morgan? Yes, Susan answered without even looking at her. When her heels clicked on the marble, Evita shouted after her, Goodbye, honey. She then hurried to Christina's desk to tell her what had just happened. Daniel was rummaging through the refrigerator for dinner when he heard the jingle of keys at the front door. As he entered the living room, he saw Susan enter with a sullen expression on her face. When she saw her future ex-husband, her expression changed to anger. This is all you're doing, isn't it? How long have you known about Grant and me? Long enough to ruin your little scheme, he retorted. So you made Ezra change his will, she said bitterly. He was going to leave everything to you and you talked him into changing that. Why do you do it? Because I wanted to make damn sure you never got to that point no matter what happened. When I heard that you and your lawyer had some plan to claim Warhol as public property by donating it to the Birch Grove Insurance Company, it couldn't happen. 
Plus, it gave me leverage to ruin your little romance with Grant. I thought his love would fade pretty quickly if he had to choose between you or Warhol. So do you really hate me that much? He looked at her incredulously. After what you tried to do, you're damn right, he shouted. She stared at him, shocked that he was so angry. After a moment, he regained his composure. There is one thing I want to know. Have you ever loved me? She sighed and plopped down in a chair. I think I loved you before, when we first got married. You were so dynamic, so full of potential. I thought you'd rise through the ranks and take me with you. She shook her heed and a bitter expression twisted her lips. Imagine my disappointment when I saw the path you chose instead. Soon after, I started looking for a better opportunity. So, money and prestige have always been important to you. Wasn't love and a good life enough? How Norman Rockwell like of you? She grinned. Don't you know it? This is what losers choose when they don't have what it takes to win. Family, friends, community. Is this your idea of losing? What I want is respect, the kind that money and position in society give. That's what's important. The rest is just window dressing. He started arguing, then decided it wasn't worth it. So, what happens next? Her bravado evaporated. I'm leaving. Thanks to you, my reputation in this city is crap. As soon as I gather everything I need, I will leave. And don't worry. Assuming we divide the property equally, I won't fight the divorce. All I want is half of our savings and half of the proceeds from the sale of the house. Sorry, Susan. You're forgetting that this house doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the university. She clenched her teeth. You've always been so smart. Why couldn't you be more ambitious? Without waiting for an answer, she headed to the bedroom. After some time, she appeared with a suitcase, a bag for clothes, and a set of cosmetics. I'm leaving now, she told him. I will ask my lawyer to contact yours, and we will finalize the divorce as quickly as possible. She threw a gloomy look at him. At least we agree on one thing. We both want to end this marriage. He looked at her curiously. So where are you going? As far as possible from here, somewhere where I can start over. Hopefully with someone a little more aggressive. Daniel looked after her. Good riddance, he thought with satisfaction. This time, Susan kept her word, and their divorce went smoothly. Daniel hated paying child support, but he couldn't argue with the fact that his soon-to-be ex-wife was now unemployed. It's a small price to pay to get rid of her, and an even smaller price to pay considering what she tried to do to you, his lawyer advised him. Meanwhile, Daniel was busy working as executor of his father's estate. Every day it seemed like there was another demand. Hand out copies of the death certificate, stop social security payments to his father, notify the IRS, send legal notices to creditors and more. After classes, Daniel regularly found himself at his father's house, sorting out possessions stashed away over the years, paying bills and sorting out his father's financial affairs. To his horror, he discovered that his father had paid for everything using paper checks. Until he was able to convert his bills to electronic payment, Daniel found himself writing more checks in a few weeks than he had in years. Although this task was time-consuming, it gave Daniel the opportunity to work in the company of Paloma and Marco. His house on campus seemed dark and gloomy, but his father's house seemed filled with light and life. It was not unusual for him to work late into the evening and have dinner with them. He felt guilty about being intrusive, but Paloma begged him to stay. Even after he had almost finished settling his father's affairs, she begged him to continue to dine with them. It's hard to cook for just the two of us, she insisted, and he was glad to give in to her request. He discovered that being part of a family was a good antidote to the grief of losing his father and the bitterness of the breakup of his marriage. A few weeks later, Daniel received a call from his father's lawyer. The probate court signed the final report on your father's estate. Now you are free to dispose of his assets as he disposes. Really? I thought filing a will usually took months. The old man grinned. Normally you'd be right, but your father's will seems to have been pushed to the top of the list. Of course, this may have something to do with the number of influential people on the board of directors of Birch Grove. 
It looks like they can't wait to get their hands on their new prize. Either way, you can move on now. An hour after Daniel received the message from the lawyer, Grant Nicholson called him and asked when Birch Grove could expect to take possession of the Warhol painting. As I think you know, the museum and I have fully complied with the terms of your father's will. And now that this has been confirmed by the will, we are obviously eager to proceed with the transfer. Although the legal obstacles were cleared, a new complication arose. The museum curator insisted that her own people pack and transport the silk screens to Birch Grove. But the transfer had to be coordinated with the security company, which had to carefully disable all protective devices and systems. Safely completing and decommissioning the various systems was a challenge. It would have taken the two groups more than a day to complete the transfer. Waiting for progress reports in his office, Nicholson felt like a child on Christmas Eve. By tomorrow morning, the most valuable piece of art Birch Grove has ever owned will be in their possession. To celebrate the occasion, the museum held a private screening the following evening for the board of directors and special guests. The awkwardness of his affair with Susan was reflected in the rearview mirror. Looking ahead, the future of the museum and its executive director looked bright indeed. After arranging with a security company to protect his father's home during the transfer of a Warhol painting, Daniel took Paloma and Marco on a day trip to the Poconos. The three of them hiked a scenic trail, had lunch at Flagstaff Lodge, and took a ride on the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railroad. By the time they got home, everyone except the security guard from the security company had left. The living room was cleaned, and the furniture was put back in its place. However, Marilyn Monroe's smiling face was missing from the painting, and all three felt its absence. Trying to lighten the gloomy mood, Daniel started a brainstorming session. It's too late to cook dinner. How about ordering some pizza? The offer was well received, and the three of them were soon sharing several large pizzas. By the time they finished, the combination of a hearty meal and the day's worries had left them all exhausted. Marco was already asleep and Daniel carried him to bed. Then, as he headed toward the front door, Paloma stopped him. Please, Daniel, stay here for the night. Without all the security systems, I will feel safer. You can sleep in your father's room. He tried to argue, but she insisted, and after a long day, he didn't want to argue. So when Paloma went to bed in her room, Daniel stripped it down to his T-shirt and boxer shorts and lay down in his father's bed. At first, the memories and the unfamiliarity of the bed kept him awakey, but he must have been more comfortable than he thought because he quickly fell asleep. However, some time later he was awakened by a sound in the corridor. As he sat up in bed, wondering if he had imagined it, he heard it again. Suddenly, he saw Paloma's dark figure open the door, tiptoe towards his bed, and slide under the covers. He began to speak but she covered his mouth with her soft hand. Please, Daniel, it's been so long and I've been so lonely. Then she removed her hand and replaced it with her lips. In an instant, his objections were forgotten, and he kissed her back with a passion that filled them both. His left arm slid around her, holding her tightly to him, while his right hand reached up to the straps of her nightgown to free her breasts. Her hands were just as busy, sliding under the waistband of his briefs and trying to pull them down. He quickly sat up and pulled off his underwear, then helped her pull her nightgown over her head. He stopped for a moment, appraisingly looking at the slender, athletic figure illuminated by the moonlight. But when he began to caress her, she interrupted him. No, I need you now, Daniel. Please don't make me wait any longer. Hearing this, he laid her back on the sheets and slid between her legs, spread in anticipation. He heard heavy breathing and realized that they were both at the peak of their arousal. Oh, yes, oh, yes, she moaned in his ear and began to rock her hips, urging him not to hold back. It was too long for him, too. Now his body took over, driving him deep into her warmth, experiencing a delicious sensation as he rolled over and then repeated the process in an accelerating rhythm dictated by long, suppressed desire. Just as he felt himself approaching climax, he heard her gasp, I can feel it, Danielle. I feel it. Now. Now. Please. Now. 
With these words, they both exploded into a sexual crescendo, leaving them clinging to each other, exhausted with pleasure. The following evening, there was a celebration of Warhol's installation in Birch Grove. Grant Nicholson arrived early, leaving his wife to come separately. All the better for you to make a grand entrance, he told her. As he was going through his holiday checklist, he was startled by a knock on his office door. Looking up, he saw the worried face of the museum curator. What? he asked impatiently. Sir, there's something wrong with Warhol's painting, the woman said anxiously. What? She's not damaged, is she? No, sir. Nothing like that. It just doesn't look quite right. It doesn't look right. What are you talking about? It's just that some of the colors don't look the way they should. This is proof of an artist, Nicholson exploded. It doesn't have to look perfect. The curator winced, but insisted on her position. And Warhol's signature, sir, it didn't fade as it should have. I mean, he would have signed it back in the 60s. The ink would have faded. Is that what's bothering you? How do you know what ink Warhol used? Come back and make sure everything is ready. The guests will arrive any minute. The little woman did not move from her place. But that's not the main thing, sir. The problem is that it's the wrong size. What? Yes, sir. Warhol's Marilyn Monroe measures 90 eggs, 90 centimeters. I looked at it to make sure. The proof must be the same size. But this print is only 89 square centimeters in area. Nicholson's mouth fell open. So what exactly do you want to say? The curator looked like she was about to cry. Sir, this print is a fake. There is no way it can be genuine. Oh my God, exclaimed the museum director, leaning back in his chair, trying to comprehend the horror of her revelation. Are you sure? He asked in despair. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. He stared silently into the distance, stunned by what was happening. Sir, sir, the curator interrupted him alarmedly. What do you want us to do? Maybe we should go and hang this after all? You are crazy, Nicholson shouted, causing the woman to flinch. If people find out that we deliberately hung a fake piece of art, it will mean the end of Birch Grove. He shuddered and then pointed to the curator. Remove the work and hide it. Tell your people to turn off the lights and put up a sign that says, Event Cancelled. When the woman hesitated, Nicholson shouted, Do it! Do it now before it's too late! The curator hurriedly left, and Nicholson leaned back in his chair, reflecting on the disaster that had befallen him. A thought occurred to him, and he rushed to his secretary's desk. Call the guard at the main entrance and tell him to lock the main gate with a chain. Quickly! Quickly! She fell silent in fear. What should I tell him so that he can tell the guests? Just say that the event is canceled due to an emergency, nothing more. Now hurry up. Oh, and no more phone calls, okay? The frightened young woman nodded. But before she could pick up the phone, the phone rang. Sir, she said, it's the curator again. Do you want to talk to her? What does she want now? He asked a rhetorical question, while the secretary sat nervously, waiting. Okay. I'll answer the phone in my office. You call the exit on the other line and make sure no one else comes in, he ordered. Returning to his desk, Nicholson picked up the phone, and the supervisor began muttering something. This is the caterer, sir, and he wants to know what to do with the food you ordered. Tell him to take it back, Nicholson exploded. Damn it, we definitely don't need this. I already tried it, sir, but he says he can't. It's already laid out on the tables, he says he is now prohibited from taking it back. Damn it, then tell him to take it to the homeless shelter. Champagne and caviar, sir? Just do it, he barked and slammed down the phone. Leaning back in his chair, Nicholson put his head in his hands, trying to think of a way out of the current situation. This can't be, he repeated. Could you please explain to me what in the name of all that is holy is going on? A familiar voice rang out. I had to walk all the way from the main gate to get up here. The shocked, exhausted director looked up at the crimson face of his chairman of the board. Adrenaline rushed through Grant's blood as he desperately tried to think of some way to calm the angry man. In fact, Mr. Worthington, we managed to avoid disaster. 
when we discovered the problems with Warhol, I knew you wouldn't want the celebration to continue. What do you mean by problem with Warhol? The executive director demanded an answer, leaning menacingly towards Nicholson. Sir, it looks like the print is fake. Fake, sir. Fake? Worthington screamed. How the hell could you accept a fake? You people are supposed to be art experts. Didn't it occur to you to inspect it before turning on the PR machine and bragging to the world about your coup? I know what it looks like, sir, but there was a will issue, and then we had to work with a security company to get it here. Sir, you should have seen what security the old man had. Enough, Worthington thundered. In its current form, Birch Grove will be a laughing stock in the art world for many years, and I think I speak for the board when I say that you are responsible for this debacle. Consider yourself fired from tonight. As soon as you can get through the terrible traffic jam you created there, you need to leave this premises and never return. Before Nicholson could protest, Van Worthington turned and walked away, not even looking at the cowering girl behind the counter outside. Oh God, I'm broke, the former executive groaned. When this comes out, not a single museum in the country will hire me. While he was sitting, indulging in self-pity, his secretary suddenly appeared. Sir, there's a call for you, she said in a trembling voice. I told you, Nicholson growled. No more phone calls. Sorry, Mr. Nicholson, but this is your wife, and she asked me to tell you that if you don't talk to her, you don't have to come home tonight. Nicholson was beaten. Okay, connect it, he agreed. Once the connection was made, he was left in no doubt about how angry Greta was. You better come up with a damn good explanation for this, Grant. I've been stuck here in traffic for God knows how long. People keep walking up and down the line of cars, and when they see me, they want to know what's going on. And I, the wife of an executive director, am as clueless as they come. If you intended to humiliate me, you could not have chosen a better way to do it. She paused to catch her breath. So, what can you say in your defense? It's very simple, dear, Nicholson said calmly. When we hung a Warhol painting in the exhibition hall, we discovered that it was a fake. Fake, she exclaimed. Of course, we couldn't show a fake, so we had no choice but to cancel the show. It's a pity that we didn't disclose the problem until the last minute. He paused, swallowed, and then decided to accept his fate. It is also unfortunate that in such situations someone has to be the scapegoat, regardless of whether he is guilty or not. Despite everything I've done for Birch Grove, Van Worthington has just relieved me of my duties. This took effect immediately. She gasped. Worthington fired your ass? Oh my God, this is truly amazing. She took a deep breath. Listen, Grant, I've put up with a lot from you over the years, not the least of which was your dirty affair with that slut you hired as development director. I've looked the other way too many times, but it's gone too far. Do not return home tonight or at any time except for your personal belongings. My lawyer will file for divorce first thing in the morning. You understand? He sighed like a defeated man. You understand? She repeated. Yes, darling. Hearing that the call was interrupted, he lowered his head to the table, completely defeated. Paloma heard about the disastrous discovery at Birch Grove and Grant Nicholson's dismissal from Christina. When she rushed to tell Daniel, he received the news with satisfaction but not with surprise. I told you I would get back at him for what he did to my Marieg, he said. She looked at him questioningly. But how could you know that this would happen? I don't, well, not really. But I arranged everything in such a way that, most likely, he would commit suicide. He grinned. I couldn't know that he would do it in such a public and humiliating way, but I was confident in the outcome, no matter what. And after what he and Susan tried to do, I think he got exactly what he deserved. Now Paloma looked at him carefully. So, what exactly did you do, Senor Daniel? I still don't understand. He smiled. Come with me to my office at the university. This way I can show you. When they reached his cluttered office, he pulled out a chair for her before sitting down himself. Let's talk about Susan first, he said. As you know, her plan was to keep her affair with Nicholson a secret, 
until Parkinson's disease killed my father. Her father's condition was rapidly deteriorating, so she was pretty sure she wouldn't have to wait too long. She couldn't apply until her father died because she needed me to inherit his property. That way, she would get half of everything. His house was valuable, but the real prize, of course, was his war hall. I don't know what legal maneuver she was planning to take, but her lawyer was confident he could get Warhol considered public property. After the settlement, she would have walked away with half the auction value, a lot of money. But you and your cousin found out about her affair, and when I found out what she and Grant were up to, I went to talk to Dad. I knew his intention was to leave Warhol to me. But after I heard about Susan's plans, I convinced him to give the job to Birch Grove. Not only would it be safe for her, but we could use the will as leverage over her. He smiled. And it worked. When Grant learned that the only way Birch Grove could get Warhol was to sever all ties with my wife, he dropped Susan like a hot potato. Daniel became thoughtful. I don't know if Grant was truly in love with Susan, but I'm pretty sure she was just using him as another step up the social ladder. Be that as it may, she quickly realized how deep his affection for her was. As soon as my father's will was read, she lost her job, her lover, and, of course, her marriage to me. Everything turned out exactly as I hoped. By the way, a friend told me the other day that Susan had moved to Allentown. He heard that the only job she could find was working in a telemarketing center selling insurance policies. Instead of moving up the corporate ladder, my ex-wife dropped significantly. This is probably the most painful punishment I could wish for her. I understand how you took revenge on Susan, Paloma nodded, and in my opinion, she got exactly what she deserved. Cheating on your husband is bad in itself, but plotting to take advantage of you and your father is horrible, she said, using a Spanish pronunciation. But what about Nicholson? What did you do with him? He grinned. You know about what happened in Birch Grove last night, right? Well, some of this. Mostly, I was just shocked to learn that your father's painting wasn't real. Sadness appeared in her eyes. In a way, I'm glad Senor Morgan didn't have to hear that cruel news. Daniel looked at her appraisingly. It says a lot that your first reaction is to think about my father. He got up from his seat. But don't be too sad about him. Reaching into the filing cabinet, he pulled out the Marilyn Monroe study guide he had used in his introductory coursey and placed it on the table. She looked at him uncertainly. A great writer once said that the best way to keep anything safe is to hide it in plain sight. Let me show you something. He turned the painting over so she could see the back wrapped in brown paper. He carefully peeled back the paper, revealing the inscription, To Ezra Morgan for all his hard work. Andy Warhol. Is this a real painting? Paloma gasped. But this is the one you use in your classes. You told me about this. It's just standing here in your office. Daniel smiled and nodded. But when did you make the exchange? Another print hung in your father's living room long before Marco and I moved here. For that matter, this was long before you knew what Susan was planning. And with all the security that Senor Morgan had, how could you replace it? Daniel grinned. At first, Dad never thought that his engraving was worth so much. After all, Warhol originally sold his screen prints for just a few hundred dollars each. But as the popularity of his work grew, Dad began to worry about having authentic works by the artist in his home. He and I discussed this, and I offered to exchange the real painting for a cheap engraving. I would leave the real Warhol here and use it in my lectures so that no one would suspect that it has any value. He would hang the print on the wall in his living room. Later, as Warhol's value continued to rise, Dad came up with the idea of installing a security system to protect him. He believed that no one would question the authenticity of the work, protected by all these security measures. It became a game for him. He was always looking for new high-tech devices for protection. Daniel smiled at Paloma. Fortunately, there were never any break-ins, but I'm sure that whole security system helped convince Nicholson that he was buying the real thing. So you changed your prints before I went to work for your father. Right. 
I intended to swap them when Dad eventually died. But after I found out about Grant and Susan, I saw a way to get back at them both. After I talked to Dad that night, he asked his lawyer to rewrite the will to make sure Nicholson would leave Susan. I then allowed Grant to take the fake Warhol, figuring he would want to display his prize as quickly and as publicly as possible. Of course, he took the bait. And just like Susan, he lost his job, his marriage, and his reputation. So what's happening now? My plan is to let all the turmoil in the Birch Grove calm down. Once that happens, I will quietly inform the board that I found a real Warhol in a storage container I didn't know existed. Once they have had a chance to verify its authenticity, I will ask that they place a plaque on it commemorating my father's connection to Warhol. Don't you regret that you don't have a Warhol for yourself? In the end, it was very valuable. He smiled at her. To be honest, I don't feel bad at all. I never wanted to take on the responsibility of owning an important piece of art. As for money, it was Susan who craved wealth and status, not me. After what I saw that craving do to her, I also am glad I can get away with it. Then his smile grew even wider. Besides, I hope that all this will help me achieve a more important goal. She looked at him uncertainly. What is this goal? Become part of a new family. What did you just say? What new family? Daniel walked around the table to take her hands. A new family with you, Marco and me. When a graduate student visiting Professor Morgan saw the couple in each other's arms, she smiled and tiptoed away. Having walked far enough along the corridor, she called a fellow student. Do you remember how we were so worried about Professor Morgan after he lost his father and wife? Well, I think our favorite professor will be okay. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.